heard the words since you were in Sunday school. You have heard these professors remind you of them both in words of warning as well as words of encouragement and maybe even a few testimonies. A counselor, a friend, a minister of music, whatever capacity you'll serve in on mission field or here at home, you'll use these two words. And they are trust God. Two single syllable words that you have heard forever, but you will discover as time passes how difficult they are to obey. Trust God. Of course, I have no way of knowing what the future holds for you. You may lose your home and everything in a fire. You may lose your spouse to an early disease, detected but not cured. You may lose your dreams, your hopes. You may lose a relationship that you have cultivated over the years. All losses are painful. And you will be brought back over and over again to the words of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I know, I know, you memorized them in vacation Bible school or when you were growing up at the knee of a godly mother and or father and your lips will move as I quote them, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. All your heart, all your ways, trust, trust. Now we have a problem with this because of several things. First of all, we are too blame self-sufficient. We have learned how to get ourselves out of jams rather than acknowledging the jam has very well been either directed or permitted by our sovereign God to teach us. And by not trusting him, we short circuit the test and go our own way, getting ourselves out of our own mess. We're too self-sufficient. Another reason we fail this test is because we're too quick to call on others. We have a lot of very capable friends. As life unfolds and you leave this school and you're involved in your church, your work of ministry, your realm of responsibility, you'll meet other people many of them much smarter than you are, most of them richer than you are, better connected than you are, and some of them will become good friends, and they will become your crutch. They have connections, and when you're up against it, they will, they'll get you through it. Another reason we don't trust is because we feel distant from the God of heaven. Don't feel too guilty about that. So did Job, as godly as he was. And yet Job said, in the midst of all of the loss, though he slay me, I will trust in him. Though he take me off this earth in the process, I leave trusting him. I will trust him. The fourth reason I would name is that we have cultivated the bad habit of worry. Uh, many of you are much better at worrying than you are at trusting. If you were to put together a worry list, 
it would outrun your prayer list. And you're worried right now about something. Most likely, it's related to something about your schoolwork, some course, some class, some test, or maybe your finances. You don't have enough money. I'll give you a word of encouragement. You'll never have enough money. So you're worried now, you're getting good at it, so you can carry that with you when you graduate because you won't have enough money then. So you're worried about that. And you do not trust God. See how practical it is? And if you think you're going to outgrow the problem, take it from this old guy today, you won't ever outgrow it. It's like lust. You never outgrow lust. You just learn to fake it. I remember attending a Navigator conference when Lawrence Sandy was president. We were at Glen Erie and they had a returned missionary, I think 87, 88 year old gentleman who um, uh, Lauren brought up to the platform and he was a longtime Navigator and Lauren said, tell me, Dr. So-and-so, when did you conquer lust? The old man said, well, Lauren, hasn't happened yet. You'll never conquer worry. It's part of the flesh. You want to, but the only way you will get through it so that you will learn from the test is to trust, to trust. To put the worry on hold, to set it aside, deliberately shoving it away, and saying, God, at this moment, I rest in you and you alone. If you're married, God, help my spouse and me to trust you, to lean on you, to wait on you, to listen to you, to endure the test with you. I put together a quick list of things that reveal how little we trust. When you choose to, to worry, you do not trust. When you try to fix what is impossible, you do not trust. When you hurry ahead and don't wait for the Lord to, to move and to change, you, you do not trust. When you lie awake, twisting and turning at night, you do not trust. When you doubt biblical principles and promises that are right here in the book you love and study, you do not trust. When you turn to others first for help, you do not trust. When you listen to human counsel and give a higher priority to that, and the principles you have just learned, you do not trust. When you manipulate and maneuver situations, you do not trust. When you step in and take charge without praying and being led by the Spirit of God, you do not trust. When you cling to others in order to feel secure and needed and loved, you do not trust. The list goes on and on. See how easy it is to live in the flesh? How easy it is to disobey trust in the Lord with all your heart? Wouldn't it be a great project over the Christmas season this year to think through Ways that you can begin to trust God regardless. Hopefully it'll be a project that you and a good friend or you and your mate can enter together. What is it we do that keep us from trusting God? And how can we break that habit? 
and watch God break through in ways that we would never have expected. Cynthia and I have a longtime friend who was raised with four brothers in Southwest Texas. They were raised on a very poor uh, ranch. They eked out a living. One of the brothers wound up getting into Baylor, going on to UCLA Law School and earning his degree in law and has since become a very fine attorney in the Southern California area. We've been friends since the mid 1970s. One of his four brothers stayed at the ranch and developed it, cultivated it. The other brothers moved away as did our friend. And the one who stayed along with his wife really turned the ranch into something much more successful. Grew crops that worked, got cattle, bred them, sold them, little by little kind of got on their feet and finally became pretty much financially stable. Then the fires of 2011 across Texas swept through their area and they came to that ranch by now they knew they would lose all all the cattle they simply opened the gate and amazingly those animals know where to go usually know where to go to find shelter and safety and they fled hundreds of them and they barely left unable to get anything much of anything in their pickup and they drove away came back a number of days later when allowed to enter this territory and uh, everything was melted everything even the metal roof on the shed on the barn had melted down and sort of peeled its way over and and what it landed on it kind of was the, that metal profile as everything is lost all possessions all pictures thankfully no lives Strangely, the cattle got back and were clustered around in a herd around an enormous oak tree and they were able to, to get them back. Of course, the fence had burned, so that has to be rebuilt. And they said to one another, we realize at that moment, our faith would either kick into action or we would move far away from the God we had loved and served. They chose the former. They determined they would rebuild. They're in the process right now. Living with a brother, putting house and home back together, having lost it all. And the Lord taught me through my shameful response. He'll win this battle. Trust him. Trust me. Trust God. Just to rest upon his promises. Just to know. Thus saith the 